you should give us your living space. It's too cramped with three kids. My husband and I were stunned by my sister-in-law's unreasonable demands. She suddenly appeared with her children at our two-family house, where we lived with my in-laws. Speechless, we watched as my in-laws sided with her. The place you two are living in is too big for just the two of you, isn't it? It's only natural to give it up for this girl here with three growing children. You two would be fine in a smaller space. Frustrated, my patience snapped. I couldn't bear it any longer. Internally, I decided I had to act against their selfish behavior. With an expressionless face, I replied, understood. As you wish, my husband and I will leave this place. Taking my husband's hand, we moved from the multi-family house to a modest apartment. A few days later, I received a call from my sister-in-law, and I answered impulsively. Her desperate yelling pierced my ears. What's going on? I got a call from the real estate agent telling us to vacate. You know something, don't you? What did you do? My name is Emily. I live with my husband, Michael, and I'm a remote worker in my 30s. I met Michael through an arranged meeting because working from home left me little chance to meet men. My parents secretly set it up, and although I was initially perplexed, I found Michael surprisingly pleasant. We hit it off and soon got married. Michael, while a bit timid, is kind and has qualities I describe as rigid and inflexible. Our married life has been smooth. His parents live in the town next to ours, and though we don't live with them, we maintain a good relationship with occasional visits and calls. A few years after our marriage, my mother-in-law suggested living together. We're getting older, and I'm anxious about the future. Hey, if you guys don't mind, why don't we live together? She said casually. Afterward, my in-laws frequently brought up the topic. It seemed like a good idea since we had a good relationship, but Michael had reservations. Michael, are you against living with your parents? Um, no, I think it'll be okay, he replied with his usual indecisive attitude. I didn't think much of it, not realizing what was to come. One day, a tragedy struck. My parents died in a traffic accident. As an only child with no close relatives, I had to arrange the funeral myself. I inherited all my parents' assets, including a significant amount of money and a family home and land. Amidst the sadness and busyness of dealing with my parents' affairs, I couldn't truly rejoice over the inheritance. My kind husband supported me throughout, wrapping me in his care. My in-laws also empathized with me, knowing I couldn't openly express my feelings. Emily, it's okay to cry when you're sad. It's impossible not to be sad after suddenly losing your parents. I know there's a lot to do, but you need to accept your feelings first, my mother-in-law reminded me. Realizing I hadn't cried since their death, I finally allowed myself to break down. After the funeral and inheritance matters settled, my in-laws, who had been keeping an eye on me, began visiting more frequently and bringing gifts. If it's bothersome, don't hesitate to say no, okay. My mother-in-law laughed it off, but I felt saved by their genuine concern and began to see them as my true parents. One day, while we were enjoying coffee and chatting, the topic of living together came up again. Hey, about the living together thing we talked about before. Emily, you must feel lonely having lost your parents. How about seriously considering living with us? We really want to live with you, Emily. Of course, whenever you're ready, but could you start thinking about it? Touched by their earnestness, I felt a warmth in my heart. After they left, I discussed it with my husband, who had just returned from work. Your parents suggested living together again. I have to dispose of my parents' house anyway, so maybe it's a good opportunity to start living together in a new home built for that purpose. What do you think, Michael? 
Well, yes, I think that will be fine. Let's do that, he agreed, though he seemed concerned. We then informed the in-laws of our desire to live together and began preparations. Due to concerns about the seismic stability of my inherited home, we decided to demolish it and build a new multi-family house on the same land. The demolition and construction were costly, but fortunately, they were covered by the inheritance from my parents. A few months later, a new multi-family house registered in my name was completed. The in-laws were pleased with the new home, and we began our new life living with them. Initially, living with the in-laws went smoothly. However, over time, I started to feel a coldness in their attitude towards us. Emily, please don't vacuum at such an hour. It's too noisy. You're home all day. You can clean anytime. You need to be more considerate of us in your daily life. At first, there were many comments about the differences in our living rhythms and the noise we made. Gradually, the in-laws began to criticize and nag more about household chores. It's nice of you to invite us for dinner, but this meal is so cheap looking. Isn't your hospitality lacking? Really, what kind of upbringing did your parents give you? Their cold words pierced my heart. I took their criticisms as a reflection of my own inadequacies, thinking they must be scolding me for my own good. With this in mind, I endured their harsh words, but their sudden change from kindness to this new attitude gradually started to depress me. When I confided this to my husband, he seemed to have some suspicions. I thought as much. No, Emily, it's not your fault. You manage the house well even though you're busy with work, and you're the ideal wife for me. So I worry about what my parents say. My husband's smile and kind words healed my heart a bit, though he seemed unable to speak up or oppose his parents, leaving the fundamental issue unresolved. Gradually, the in-laws' neglect extended beyond words and attitudes. They stopped contributing to the shared expenses for living and utilities that we had previously split. Both you and Michael work, so you have money, right? Isn't it terrible to expect us, who live on a pension, to pay? When did you become such ungrateful children? Faced with such accusations, we had no choice but to cover the expenses for the in-laws as well. Then one day, a shocking event occurred. My husband cheated on me. Out of anger, I divorced him. Let us live here too, my sister-in-law said as she brought her three young children to our home. My husband and I were baffled, but the in-laws welcomed them. This is your home too, so of course we won't turn you away. In fact, I'm thrilled to live with my grandchildren. Such a terrible husband to cheat. You must be tired. Come in and rest first. Yay, thank you. I'll be coming in then. Without seeking our consent, the in-laws gleefully welcomed them in. It would have been one thing if it were just a visit, but to move them in without our consent. I hesitantly approached my mother-in-law. A mother, suddenly living with a sister-in-law like this is a bit. She glared at me, sensing my hesitation. Why do you want her, abandoned by her husband, to be lost on the streets with such young children? How can you say such cold things? Are you even human? I hurriedly tried to explain. No, that's not what I meant. But if we are going to live together, I just wish we could have had some agreement. What's the difference? You're just against living with them. They will be living in our space, so we don't need your consent. Don't interfere. She slammed the door, leaving me stunned by their unreasonable behavior and arguments. The forced cohabitation with my sister-in-law and her children turned into a nightmare. Her kids would barge into our living space, running around and breaking things. No matter how many times I told them not to come into our room, they wouldn't listen. Asking my sister-in-law to intervene was fruitless. Can you not interfere with my household and don't scold my children without my permission? I'm not scolding them. 
I just wish you would teach them some basic rules, like not roaming around in someone else's living space or making noise in someone else's home. That's what I mean by you being arrogant, living in our parents' house and acting like you own the place. She yelled, slamming the door again. She mistakenly thought the house was in the in-law's name, but I couldn't correct her. The children's behavior never improved. They invaded my office, disrupting my work, and the daily noise affected both my professional and private life, wearing me down mentally. Observing the children, I noticed something troubling. Although they appeared well-dressed, closer inspection revealed untreated cavities and bitten, ragged nails, clear signs of neglect. The sister-in-law was barely taking care of them, and the in-laws, too fond of their grandchildren, did not admonish them either. Since your sister and her kids moved in, our lives have been chaotic. I'm reaching my limit. When I finally expressed my exhaustion, my husband revealed his long-held concerns. Apparently, the in-laws had always favored the sister-in-law while neglecting him. Despite their pleasant public persona, which hid any family discord, they had always been regarded as a close-knit family of four. My husband moved out when he started working, and since then, the in-laws' demeanor softened, becoming kinder and more attentive. This behavior continued even after he married me, leading him to believe they had changed. However, their attitudes since we began living together were just like they were in his childhood. The in-laws doted on the sister-in-law while disregarding and even despising my husband. This became clear when they accepted the sister-in-law's cohabitation. My husband realized their true nature hadn't changed. It seemed that whether we lived with them or not determined how they showed their true colors. They were kind to outsiders if we weren't living together, but their real selves were revealed once we moved in. I'm really sorry for not realizing this earlier and for making you suffer, he said, tears in his eyes. His confession shocked me. To think that the in-laws, who were so kind before we moved in, we're actually looking down on us with false pretenses all along. Although I had been vaguely sensing their recent attitudes, facing the truth was still saddening. However, as much as he kept silent about it, my husband was also a victim, just like me. I couldn't be angry with him. Thank you for telling me, Michael. You did nothing wrong, so please don't apologize. Learning the true nature of the in-laws lifted a weight off my shoulders. My perceived inferiority towards them vanished. Since then, I secretly began preparing so we could escape from the in-laws and sister-in-law at any time. A few weeks after Michael's revelation, on a holiday while we were relaxing in the living room, my sister-in-law came up with an outrageous suggestion. It's too cramped where mom and dad are living and the kids can't play freely. So give us your living space. What? Are you telling us to leave this house? My husband and I were stunned by her unreasonable demand. Oh, you finally get it. Yes, I'm telling you to leave this house. At a loss for words, I saw my mother-in-law come up behind her. The place you two are living in is too big for just the two of you, isn't it? Giving it up for this girl with three growing children is only natural as a human being, right? She said with a smirk. I couldn't hold back. How can you say that? This is our home too. Where are you telling us to live? I don't care. You could live in a storeroom. It would be just right for the two of you, my mother-in-law said dismissively, with my sister-in-law agreeing. Faced with their behavior, I felt my patience snap. I couldn't tolerate it any longer. Internally, I resolved that they deserved consequences for their selfish actions. With an expressionless face, I responded, understood. My husband and I will leave. However, leaving immediately is difficult, so please wait a week for our departure. In a week, we will leave as you wish. Taking my husband's hand, we turned our backs on the cheering sister-in-law and her children. Once we were alone, my husband looked remorseful and apologized, 
Emily, I'm sorry. I revealed my plan. It's okay. I have everything planned out. My husband was surprised but agreed. We proceeded with the preparations for moving, and the week passed. As mom and dad wished, we are leaving this house. In return, we will sever our familial ties with you and my sister today. The in-laws seemed indifferent to my husband's declaration of cutting ties. Yes, please do. A failure like you is no son of mine. Finally, the nuisances are gone. Now this house is just for us. Looking coldly at the rejoicing in-laws, my husband and I left the multifamily house. We moved into a rented apartment that we had arranged temporarily. In the quiet and cramped space, we began to live peacefully for the first time in a long while. A few days after the move, while I was working from home and about to take a break, I noticed a flood of missed calls from the in-laws and sister-in-law on my phone. Surprised by this, another call came in from my sister-in-law. I impulsively answered, and her yelling voice pierced my ears. What's going on? I got a call from the real estate agent telling us to vacate. You know something, don't you? What did you do? Since Michael had revealed the in-law's true nature, I had been preparing to sell the house. I quietly requested estimates from several real estate agents, selected one, and proceeded with the sale agreement at the timing when they declared to kick us out. Although the house was new and a multifamily home, its appraisal was low, but the land was prime property, so it fetched a decent price. I managed to recover a considerable amount by letting go of the land and the new multifamily house that I inherited from my parents. That's not right. This house is supposed to be mom and dad's. How can you just sell it? Mistakenly thinking the house was in the in-law's name, the sister-in-law was enraged. No, the house was built in my name, so it was truly my property. I was just renting part of the living space to mom and dad. Well, now it belongs to someone else since I've let it go. What? It appeared that my sister-in-law had put me on speakerphone as I could hear not only her, but also my mother-in-law's shocked voice. What? This house wasn't in Michael's name. I thought it was, so naturally it belonged to us, his parents. You deceived us, you liar. When you said you were leaving, normally you would transfer ownership to us. What an unfilially and deceitful person. The in-laws and sister-in-law hurled insults and ranted. I dismissed them sharply. Deceived. That sounds terrible. The misunderstanding was yours. I merely disposed of my own property, so please leave quickly. After saying that, I hung up on my still yelling sister-in-law and her family. Forced by the eviction notice from the real estate agent, the in-laws had no choice but to vacate the new home. According to rumors, after losing their place to live, the in-laws and sister-in-law started renting an apartment. However, the children's mischief and noise led to numerous complaints from neighbors. The severity and number of complaints were such that the landlord couldn't remain silent, and they were evicted in less than a month. Desperate and without a place to live, the in-laws shockingly stormed into my husband's company. Call Michael out. We are his family. We need to talk to him, they demanded in the company lobby. When the receptionist realized the seriousness of the situation, as the in-laws made a scene, she discreetly contacted my husband while holding back the sister-in-law and her parents. Upon receiving the message, my husband confided in his boss and called the police, who then restrained the in-laws and sister-in-law upon arrival. Michael showed himself only after the police had arrived. Even as they were being taken away, the in-laws fiercely resisted, insisting and shouting at him. You unfilial child. It's your fault we lost our home. Take responsibility. And calling the police? Are you sane? How could you treat your family like this? Facing their desperate cries, Michael responded calmly, I have no parents or sister. 
I have people who claimed those titles, but I severed ties with them a few days ago. You and I are strangers. I simply asked the police to handle some disruptive people in our company's lobby. What's wrong with that? Stunned by Michael's words, the in-laws were speechless. Meanwhile, the sister-in-law continued to berate him, crying out, you traitor. Heartless, until she was finally taken away in a police car. During the interrogation, we met with the sister-in-law's husband and his parents. They revealed that it was the sister-in-law who had the affair, not her husband. Furthermore, he had initiated the divorce, but it hadn't been finalized yet. Due to this incident and the police involvement, he demanded a divorce again and sued for adultery damages. Reluctantly, the sister-in-law agreed, and their divorce was finally settled. After their divorce, custody of the children went to the sister-in-law's ex-husband. With the help of his parents, he disciplined the children strictly, and they reportedly turned into well-behaved kids. The in-laws and sister-in-law moved into a rundown apartment. It turned out that during the time they lived with us, they spent extravagantly on luxury items while making us pay for living and utility expenses, leaving them with almost no savings. The sister-in-law was furious. What's this? I wasn't informed. I was counting on your money for compensation and living expenses. Well, I didn't know about that. The divorce and infidelity were your doing. Pay your own compensation. You've brought this upon yourself. What did you say, you old hag? She retorted. Even the in-laws, who had doted on her, seemed to have lost all patience, and now they argue daily over money. With no one left to rely on and struggling financially, she reluctantly started working part-time. However, she seems to be causing problems at work, and it's likely only a matter of time before she's fired. Meanwhile, the in-laws' spending habits haven't changed, and they're living paycheck to paycheck without the ability to save. With their finances continuously dwindling, it seems likely they'll be evicted from their apartment soon due to unpaid rent. As we hear about their decline through the grapevine, my husband and I use the money from selling the ancestral home and the duplex to buy a modest single-family home. Together, we're enjoying a peaceful and happy life.